Welcome to our Sunday worship service. I am Pat Hurst, and I'll be your celebrant this morning. I've been a member of UUCP for 13 years. The very first time I came to service here, I knew this was the right place for me. I love this church and all the things we stand for, and I'm grateful for all the friends that I have. I met Patricia Jessup here 12 years ago, and our first date was Thanksgiving dinner at Pat and Dan Rathman's home in Deary. Pat and Dan are here today. Thanks, Pat and Dan. Um, we were married seven and a half years ago. Several months ago, I watched uh, Carl Sagan's video, The Pale Blue Dot. I was deeply moved by his words about cherishing this earth and showing kindness to others. So I suggested that we have an Earth Day service based on it, and thankfully, Elizabeth and the worship team agreed that, that it was a good idea, and they saw fit to invite me to be celebrant. I'd like to extend a special welcome to all those who are joining us for the first time. We are very glad that you are here. If you've come in person, you should have received a welcome packet with an information card on it. If you fill that out and drop it in the offering basket, we will be in touch with you to support you in finding your way in our community. If you are joining us online, there's a link on our website to an electronic version of the same card. Our welcoming committee members have yellow name tags and can answer any questions you have any additional, about anything additional. Whether you are newer or not, please consider staying for coffee and conversation after the service, either downstairs or in our fellowship hall or in our Zoom room. And now let's say our words of welcome together. Whether this is your first or your thousandth Sunday with us, and whether you stroll, roll, and or land, or land skin, we are glad you chose to join us. We are one people of many beliefs, identities, origins, sexualities, and genders. All are welcome here. Now we will take a moment to say hello across the technical divide. First, we're going to show the people joining us on Zoom. If you are at home, please turn on your camera. No, people at home, please wave. Now, people who are attending the service in the building, it's your turn to wave. We do have a couple of announcements. We've reserved the left side of the sanctuary in front of the sound booth for people who need the folks around them to wear masks. We have masks available at both entrances if you need one, or you are more than welcome to sit in another part of the room. And I think Ryan has a couple of announcements. it on? Okay. I have three quick announcements. So first, um, in case anybody needs a quieter space or somewhere else that they want to watch the service from today and other Sundays going forward, the RE office downstairs I'll have open with the service being played on Zoom. So if you just need a, a separate quieter space to get away to, that will be available. In case you don't know where the RE office is, if you head down the stairs or the elevator and hang a right, it's the last room on the right before you hit the, the west exit. Uh, second, you might notice if you've been in the fellowship hall, we have all brand new chairs in there. So we're looking for homes for the old chairs. We set aside enough for outside seating, but we have all the plastic and black wooden chairs lined up against the wall. 
So if you want them for your own use, you can feel free to take them today. Or if you know or an organization that could use them, please let us know and we'll, we'll make contact and find good homes for all of those. We'll also be replacing the heavy wooden tables down there sometime soon. So if you have a good place for those, uh, please let me know. And then the third thing is our lost and found has been piling up. So I have all that set out in the fellowship hall. If you see something that's yours or you know who it belongs to, please grab it. Um, if it doesn't get at home today, it'll be heading to the Hope Center. So that's it. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Sam Welsh. I'm the music director here. Um, I just wanted to share uh, that last week, um, those of you who were able to attend Washira's uh, evening of African American spirituals, it was an amazing concert. Um, I am presenting a check after the service to the Black Student Union today for $681 that we collected. Mm -hmm. So many thanks to uh, Washira, of course, who, who generously uh, led this effort. Um, and then hopefully, um, I think we'll do some more events like this. It was a lot of fun, I think, for, for everybody. Um, all right, thank you all. That ends the announcements. We preface our service by acknowledging that our church was built on the ancestral homelands of the Nimibu, called the Nez Perce by the French-speaking traders, the Palouse, and the Stichumsh, called the Coeur d'Alene. Let us pause and remember that we live on ground that is sacred, ground that was stolen, ground that cries out for justice and responsible stewardship. May our remembering help us find the courage to do our part to restore wholeness to the earth and all her peoples. We are hoping Folks joining us via Zoom have a chalice or a candle to light and something to light it with. Let's light our chalices together. In the light of truth and of love, we gather to see and seek to share. Please be seated. Good morning. I am the Reverend Dr. Elizabeth Stevens, and I am lucky enough to serve this congregation as its minister. The worship theme this month is interdependence, which is one of the six core values that revolve around love at the center. This is a relatively new model proposed by the Article II Commission to concise, concisely explain our shared faith. And it comes out of a nationwide conversation that's been underway for several years, one that's still ongoing, actually. Um, we here at the UUCP like the proposed language, so we went ahead and made the banners in advance of what will be the final vote. <laughs> so hopefully it passes. <laughs> Anyway, interdependence is a core value that connects back to our seventh principle, respect or reverence for the interdependent web of life of which we are a part. As Unitarian Universalists, we see interdependence as a truer expression of how to relate to one another, to the planet, than independence or individualism. 
The truth is none of us got to where we are without a multitude of people who have gone before. My friend, the Reverend Cheryl M. Walker, likes to tell the story of a guy who identified as a self-made man, and he was very proud and called himself a self-made man everywhere he went. But then he had a Scrooge-like experience that included visitations from his first grade teacher who asked him, well, did you teach yourself to read? His first boss who said, well, did you learn how to run a business on your own? And then his mother, <laughs> all of whom reminded him that he really was not self-made, that he would not have gotten where he got without their help. So during today's service, we'll reflect together on that video put together by Carl Sagan called The Pale Blue Dot. Like the ghosts in Cheryl's story, it points us toward embracing interdependence by acknowledging the complexity and the fragility of life on this planet, this tiny planet circling a medium-sized star on the far edge of a spiral galaxy known as the Milky Way. Opening our minds and hearts to the immensity of space and the unlikelihood of our very existence could be awe-inspiring, could be anxiety-producing, or it could be both. So let's begin by singing. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit. We'll join in hymn number 301 in the gray hymnal, Touch the Earth, Reach the Sky. Now, let's take a moment to engage in the practice of generosity together. For those of you able to make a financial contribution, the logistics are on the screen. We typically give away all the cash from our Sunday offering to local charities whose missions align with our values, a program called the Month of Sundays. This month, recipients are the area food banks who make sure that all our neighbors have enough to eat. To donate, please indicate month of Sundays on your check or from the dr online drop-down menu. In spirit of love and for the continuing work of this church, we will now take some time to practice generosity together.
And now I invite Patricia Jessup forward to lead us through joys and sorrows. Now is the time. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Now is the time in the service when we lift up our joys and sorrows. The sharing of joys and sorrows is a sacred ritual in our community, a time to briefly acknowledge truly significant life events, either by submitting them in advance, typing them in the chat, or coming forward and sharing in person. So go ahead, get comfortable, take a few deep breaths, and check in with your heart. Sorrow comes into every life. Each of us suffers losses and setbacks. Each of us struggles. And each of us sometimes knows defeat. Together we create a circle of compassion wide enough to hold all the sorrow in our heart, all the pain in our lives. If you have a sorrow to share, I invite you to come forward now and form a line. Please try and keep it to a sentence or two. I light this candle in memory of uh, the Reverend David Rankin, um, who died this week. He was um, a great, uh, one of the ancestors that myself and my colleagues most looked up to. Um, and he lived here in Moscow with his wife, Ginger. Um, dear, dear, wise man, and he will be very much missed. Yellow is good. Um, I'm Jennifer Rod, and I'm lighting this candle for, um, I just found out this week that uh, a good friend of mine from middle school, high school, and we did a lot of crazy and weird things together, and that she died last year, and I didn't know about it. So anyway, this is for Pat Liebers, Patricia Jane Liebers. Thank you. Joy, too, comes into every life. Hearts are made to love. This world and the people in it are unbearably beautiful. Together we create a circle of celebration deep enough to hold all the joys in our lives. If you have a joy to share, I invite you to come forward now and form a line. Please try to keep it to a sentence or two. This one's personal. Uh, my son, Daniel, my younger son, Daniel, um, got accepted to and got a big scholarship to Vermont Law. So he's going to law school. Two quick joys. The tree frogs have started to sing in my pond and uh, I got help a lot of emotional support at the recovery center this week due to certain issues. So um, in my sister and brother-in-law who live in Florida, their youngest son was born very early and spent 322 days in the NICU 
but came home last week. He's on oxygen, but he's able to finally be home with his two older sisters, and they're very excited to have him home, and they'll be moving to Spokane in May, so we're excited to have them nearby. Every life, every heart, every one of us at any moment is filled with joys, sorrows, with hopes. <coughs> Excuse me. Dreams with concerns. I'll light a final candle for all that remains in our hearts or are still too tender to share. Life, however fragile, is a gift, and we in this community of memory, caring, and hope celebrate this gift today and all days. Amen and blessed be. Our meditation this morning will be the pale blue dot. That's here, that's home, that's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, Every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization. Every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a mote of dust, suspended in a sunbeam. The Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings. How eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle? Not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image. To me, 
It underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known.
so a few weeks ago, I came across a story about the world's oldest terrarium. This guy in Surrey has a terrarium that has been sealed since 1960. His name is David Latimer, and he started the terrarium with a quarter pint of compost, some water, and some spiderwort seeds. The last time he opened it was in 1972 when he added a little bit of water. I was a baby in 1972. Other than that, it's been completely self-sustaining. The plants release oxygen and moisture into the air through photosynthesis. The water builds up and drips on the plants. The leaves fall and rot, releasing carbon dioxide and so on ad infinitum. It's pretty miraculous, really. What it made me think about, though, is the fact that our whole planet is like a giant terrarium hanging in space. Obviously, our planetary system operates on a different scale. It's almost unimaginably complex with billions of different life forms, all with roles to play. But the concept is the same. Nothing goes to waste. Nothing gets added. I mean, those tiny meteorites don't really count. The planet isn't sealed in glass. Rather, it's surrounded by dead, cold, empty space for millions of miles. Earth is a closed system. Water is recycled. Oxygen carbon dioxide, constantly recycled, nutrients recycled. Everything exists in a delicate and fluid balance, which is not stasis, but give and take and move. Nature has mechanisms it uses to adapt, to adjust. So how did life come to be on our planet-sized terrarium? The next bit may sound a little familiar to some of you, as I pulled it from a sermon I gave back in 2017, also at Pat's suggestion. Our Earth was born 4.5 billion years ago. It was an incredibly hostile environment, covered in lava, smothered in noxious gases. Its atmosphere was comprised primarily of carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide, and was subject to huge, dramatic storms. The sun was smaller and weaker, and its light just barely penetrated the atmosphere. The sky was red, the oceans olive green. As if all that weren't enough, for 600 million years, the poor baby Earth was subjected to something called the heavy bombardment. The entire globe melted and reformed as asteroids and comets smashed into the surface. At one point, another planet the size of Mars rammed into Earth, vaporizing the entire surface. Our moon is made out of remnants of that mighty collision. It's hard to believe that in this terribly hostile environment, life could arise, but this is when exactly when scientists believe it did. Remember the old adage that if an infinite number of monkeys were given an infinite number of typewriters, one of them would type the entire script of Shakespeare's Hamlet? On early Earth, in the words of Robert Hazen, unimaginable numbers of molecular combinations were being tried on trillions of trillions of mineral surfaces across almost 200 million square miles of Earth's surface, surface for many millions of years. And one of those inconceivably immense numbers of molecular combinations, someplace, sometime, worked. It learned to self-replicate and evolve. And that invention changed everything. About 3.5 billion years ago, the bombardment had ceased and microbial life could survive outside its hiding places. It was at this point that microbes developed chlorophyll and photosynthesis, known as the great liberator of biology. If you remember your elementary school science class, you know that the waste product, one of the waste products of photosynthesis, is oxygen. 
And what came next then in the story of life, the story of our planet, is the slow oxygenation of our atmosphere. Then microbes came together to form cells. Cells came together to form multicellular life. Life forms mutated and died and evolved. And eventually, we get the complex and unimaginably diverse interdependent web of all life here on our pale blue dot of a terrarium planet. Now, while we'd like to think that we human beings are the crown achievement of evolution, the truth is that we are only one evolutionary line among many. We may be the most destructive, dubious distinction, the only species known to cause a mass extinction event all on our own, but we are still evolving. Some of the problems I see in the world stem from the uncomfortable truth that our technology has overtaken our biological evolution. Our brains and bodies weren't designed to live the kind of life most of us are living. It's also worth noting, kind of a side note, that the evolutionary process, if anything, seems to be a little biased toward beetles. There are almost 400,000 species of beetles, with more being discovered all the time. That's 40% of insects, 25% of animals. If there is a grand purpose to this Earth terrarium experiment, it's way more likely, based on the evidence, to be the development of the ultimate beetle than the evolution of a self-aware, upright primate. One of the lessons we might take from observing small-scale terrariums is this. Nothing is wasted. Everything in Mr. Latimer's jar lives, dies, and is broken down and repurposed. And so it is here on Earth. The spiritual version of reincarnation envisions our individual consciousnesses. Consciousnesses? Conscious nigh? living on in another body. We have no way of knowing whether that's true or not, but we can embrace the biological version of reincarnation and allow ourselves to feel grateful for all the living things that died, were broken down, and became the biological building blocks for these bodies we inhabit. We can acknowledge that one day we too will be broken down, turned into biological building blocks. We can accelerate the process by cremation or now those human composting systems. Have you seen the articles about those human composting? They're so cool. Um, we can try to slow it. We can try to slow it by filling dead bodies with preservatives and encasing them in concrete. But if we telescope out and think in planetary time, even those measures aren't going to ultimately be sufficient. So perhaps there's more grace in yielding to the biological processes that break us down. Perhaps there's a way to embrace the immortality that comes from being part of a closed system, to find some comfort in it. Now, as I said, the balance in those small terrariums isn't stasis. Things sprout, grow, die, decay, change. Water evaporates, condenses, drips, and evaporates again. Sometimes there's an overgrowth of a particular type of organism, and when there is, the system self-corrects. Plants that don't accept the limits of the resources die off. Microorganisms that overpopulate die off due to lack of nutrients, and something else grows in their place. And that's how things work here on Earth as well. It behooves us to remember that the primary mechanisms of evolution are mutation and death. It is not a pretty process. Evolutionary lines shift and change and specialize and sometimes die off completely. Mother Nature can be ruthless. By definition, though, closed systems have enough resources to sustain themselves. We have enough water. We have enough nutrients. What we are lacking is the capacity to distribute those resources efficiently. Humans hoard resources. We waste them. We pollute. We extract. We discard. There is no question that we are disruptors of the delicate balance of our biosphere. 
And there are plenty of strategies that are within our understanding that could help return the whole system to equilibrium. And then there are some strategies that are beyond our understanding. The biosphere turns out to be more complex than our computer models can handle. One of the things I tell myself when climate despair is rearing its ugly head is that the planet will be fine. Life will persist. If we can't turn things around in time, if we can't change our ways, our evolutionary line will die off as so many have before. And I grieve for the other species we'll take with us. But sometimes, especially when I'm in that dark place, I think if we can't generate the collective political will to make the changes necessary to keep the earth habitable for our species and others, we sort of deserve to have our evolutionary line die off. And that said, it's likely going to take much longer than our lifetimes for that to happen. Evolution happens on an extended time scale. And in the meantime, the people who are bearing the blunt of climate, brunt of climate change are mostly the people who bear the least responsibility for causing it, while those who bear the most responsibility are mostly insulated by their privilege from the consequences. This is a problem when only solved when we cultivate our capacity to both experience the reality of interdependence and ground our ethical framework firmly in it. The planet is ultimately unconcerned with the continuance of Homo sapiens, but we Homo sapiens are rightly concerned. And so we need to pay attention to what's going on in this planet-sized closed biosphere. We need to make the changes we can make that will increase our odds of survival. It's also a good idea to be realistic about what's coming so that we can develop resilience, both practical and psychological. As my colleague, the Reverend Harley, Hil Hillary Cruz-Chania puts it, collectively as a species, life on Earth as a global village, we are in a lifeboat, and we always were. Although millennia ago, we couldn't see it quite so clearly. Once there were people who thought that the world only extended as far as the horizon. Today we know that our home is a single spherical lifeboat suspended in the infinite darkness of space. At the intersection of climate change and the inevitable eventual exhaustion of our petroleum resources is a crisis that has been building, a crisis we know about but that we keep at the periphery of our minds most of the time. It's a bummer. So I don't particularly relish preaching about it. But, well, we don't have the luxury to feel overwhelmed or to forget about it and do nothing. So how do we, here on this ever-warming, seemingly shrinking lifeboat, awaken to our creative possibilities? End of quote. We live a, in a time when it is incumbent upon us to change our way of being human. Homo sapiens has, over the years, become homo consumerous. We can't move backward and become sapiens or wise again, relying on the ancient earth-based and earth-friendly traditions, but perhaps we can move forward. Perhaps we can become homo religiosus in the sense that religion means to rebind. We can rebind ourselves to the natural world with its cycles and checks and balances. We can embrace and engage our sense of interdependence with humility and courage. As Thomas Berry has put it, we must come to understand that the universe is a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects. Just as Martin Buber invited us to shift away from objectifying people from I-it relationships to I-thou relationships, we will be transformed if we allow ourselves to engage in I-thou relationships with everything in creation, from specks of dust to ants to elephants to the cosmos itself. As we live into this expanded and deepened experience of interdependence, we'll find the courage to make the needed changes in our way of being human. We might eat more plant-based, or put in a garden, we might compost instead of throwing food away. We might bike or walk sometimes instead of driving. It's going to vary from person to person, but I believe we have a responsibility to discern what changes are accessible to us. 
what changes are accessible to us. We might also work to advocate for political change, joining groups like the Citizens Climate Lobby, the Sierra Club, or locally, NIMIPU Protecting the Environment, or Friends of the Clearwater. There's so many. We can be early adapters of sustainable technologies the way we have been with this building, putting in solar panels and a heat pump. As we saw with a gas outage last fall, this doesn't just decrease our carbon footprint, it insulates us against the inevitable bumps and gaps in service that we'll be seeing more of as the carbon economy grinds to a slow and ugly stop. We can prepare our homes and our cities for the climate refugees. There are people who are going to need hospitality, and our rallying cry here at the UCP is radical hospitality. Not everyone has the resources to be early adopters of sustainable technologies, but those people will have worth and dignity, and they need to be met with compassion when things start to crumble. We also, I should say, as things continue to crumble. We also need to prepare our hearts so that we can keep them open in the face of tragedy, both close in and far away. We need to discipline our minds so that we can face reality but circle back again and again to hope and a sense of agency. We need to nourish our spirits with beauty and laughter and friendship Above all, we need to let the fact of our interdependence not just inspire us to action, but move us to gratitude. It's true, there is no planet B. But we shouldn't let our fear for the future keep us from bowing down in awe at the pure fact that we have planet A. What a miracle to be alive at all. We are not separate from life, separate from nature. We are a part of all that is. And as such, we have a role to play. Out of that sense of awe and gratitude, out of the knowledge that we are interdependent, we are connected, we act and live and love and hope here on the pale blue dot that is our beloved home. How can we do otherwise? So be it, and so may it be. I invite you to rise now in body or spirit. Let's sing hymn number 1064, Blue Boat Home.
Please be seated. Our closing readings are some more quotes from Carl Sagan. The nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, the carbon in our apple pies were made in the interiors of collapsing stars. We are made of star stuff. If we are to survive, our loyalties must be broadened further to include the whole human community, the entire planet Earth. We live in a society exquisitely dependent on science and technology. We have also arranged things so that almost no one understands science and technology. This is a prescription for disaster. We might get away with it for a while, but sooner or later this combustible mixture of ignorance and power is going to blow up in our faces. When we recognize our place in an immensity of light years and in the passage of ages, when we grasp the intricacy, beauty, and subtlety of life, then that soaring feeling, that sense of elation and humility combined, is purely spiritual. I invite you to join now in our sung benediction, There is a Love. Please say with me the words to extinguish our chalice. We extinguish this chalice that it might glow gently in our hearts. May it light our paths as we leave this place. May it guide our way until we are together again. There's a reason we put love at the center. There's a reason we always put love at the center, and it's because it's love that will guide us, love that will lead us, love for one another, love for life, love for this beautiful planet. So let me just say I am so glad to have all of you on this pale blue dot with me, embodying all of the goodness and love and hope that any human could ever need. Go forth in peace. Come back next Sunday. Thank you for being here. Mm -hmm.